Welcome back. Uh, so we're going to continue the lesson this week um, by discussing truth tables. Okay? Truth tables is, are one of the primary methods we have in modern logic for assessing the validity uh, of an argument. But they're also a good way to demonstrate how uh, our connectives are supposed to be working where truth is concerned. So let's look at them individually. Uh, let's start with the simplest one, negation. Now, here we have our symbol for negation and the natural language translation, right? It is not the case that. Okay, so a truth table always starts the same way. You're going to have some kind of horizontal line, and then you're going to have a vertical line blocking it off into two different regions. On the left side of this vertical line, we're going to provide what are called our reference columns. The reference columns are just where you list all of the sentence letters that you're using. Let's say that I'm just going to use P, right? Just, I only have P right now. So I'm going to put P up here, okay? Now, on the right side of this vertical bar is where you actually put uh, the premises as they are, right? So let's say my only premise is not P, okay? So I have P and I have not P. That's it. Now, what a truth table's job is, is that it's trying to give you all of the possible truth values in the world, right? So what you need to ask is, uh, what are the possibilities for P? Well, it can be true and it can be false, but that's it, right? Within our system, at least, there are some more advanced logics that disagree. But within our system, there's only two possibilities, true and false. So we need to write both of those down, true and false. Okay. Now, you give the same truth values for P everywhere. So I know that P has to be true and false. Now I can give truth values for the negation symbol. The way the negation symbol works truth functionally, which is to say on a truth table, is that it flips the truth values of whatever it's applied to. So in this case, it would be false, true, right? You see how it's the exact opposite of the thing it's applied to. That's all that not does, okay? So when you're filling out a truth table and you have a negation, you're just going to flip uh, the truth values of whatever it's applied to. Okay, so negation is pretty simple. And let's look at conjunction. This is our first two-place connective, right? We're going to have to use two sentence letters. Technically, you could join uh, the same thing to itself. This is a meaningful sentence in TFL, but it's a rather boring one, right? We know that P and P if P is true, right? Let's do P and Q, okay? So I want to know the truth value of P and Q, right? Well, I need to give my sentence letters in my reference column. Each one of them gets its own uh, little area here, P and Q. Now, we have to ask ourselves again, how many possibilities are there? Well, I know P can be true or false. Q can also be true and false. So should I have just two? No, I'm going to need four rows here. Here's why. True, false, true, false. True, true, false, false. Notice that there is a world in which both P and Q are true. There's a world in which P is true and Q is false. There's a world where P is false and Q is true. And lastly, a world where they're both false. So there are four distinct possibilities. There aren't any more, just four. But there are always four when you have two sentence letters. So the general rule for determining how many rows you're going to need for a truth table is you will always need two to the nth power where n equals the number of sentence letters you have. So if you have three sentence letters, for example, like P, Q, R, then you're going to need 
eight rows in order to get all the possibilities. And, but for now, we're just gonna stick with two sentence letters. So we have four rows, okay? Now, what about the order that I wrote those trues and falses in? Well, there's a pretty simple process you can follow so that you always have it uh, uh, the same every time. You're gonna start with your rightmost uh, reference column. That's Q in this case. You're going to write true and false iteratively, so one after the other, all the way down. I know it has four rows, so I only do it four times. You're going to double the number of trues before you get to falses for the, the one uh, immediately to the left. So I'm going to do two trues before I do falses. That's it, all right? And we would continue that pattern if we had additional rows. Okay, so the sentence letters are the same everywhere. Once we fill them out, we should fill them in here. So I know P is true, true, false, false. Q is true, false, true, false. Now we need to solve for the conjunction. Well, conjunction means and. And so this is only going to be true when both sides are true. That means on row one, it is true because P is true and Q is true. But on row two, it's false. Why? Because Q is false. On row three, it's false because P is false. And on row four, it's false because both sides are false. Okay? So again, in order for a conjunction to be true, both conjuncts must be true. Every other time, it's false. Every other time. Now let's look at disjunction. Again, let's do P or Q. So uh, we need our reference columns. It's going to look very similar to what we just did. True, false, true, false, true, false, sorry, true, true, false, false. Let's fill them in again. True, false, true, false. Okay. Or, or disjunction, means that it is true so long as either side or both sides are true. In other words, there's only one way for a disjunction to be false. Only one. And that's if both sides, if both disjuncts are false. So on row one, we know it's true because P is true and Q is true. And we're using inclusive or. So that means it gets to be true here. On row two, we know it's true because P is true. Even if Q is false, the disjunction is still true. On row three, we know it's true because Q is true. But on row four, neither P or Q are true, which means this has to be false. Okay? So while conjunction is very restrictive, right? There's only one way for it to be true. Disjunction is very permissive. There's only one way for it to be false. Okay. What about the conditional? If P, then Q. Again, let's get our reference columns. True, false, true, false. True, true, false, false. And true, false, true, false. Okay. A conditional is somewhat odd. It might take a little getting used to. A conditional is going to be true unless you have a true antecedent, that's the left side, and a false consequent, that's the right side. All other times, it's going to be true. Okay? So, in the first case, on row one, P is true and Q is true. Well, that's great. That means the conditional is true on row one. But on row two, P is true and Q is false. That means the conditional is false here. Why? Why should that mean the conditional is false here? Well, the conditional is telling you that if P happens, Q also has to occur. 
right? And on row two, we're saying, well, P happened, but Q didn't. That breaks the conditional, right? That's not allowed. So it has to be false on this row. Now, on row three, P is false while Q is true. That's also going to be true. Why? Well, because we don't know that this relationship between P and Q failed, right? Q can be true even if P isn't. All we care about with a conditional is that if P happens, then Q has to happen, right? That's the only thing the conditional is looking for. Since we don't know anything about P right now, you know, it's not true, um, that's fine. The conditional remains, okay? And lastly, if P is false and Q is false, the conditional is still true. So again, the only way for a conditional to be false is if the antecedent is true while the conditional is false. That's the only way. Okay. Lastly, the biconditional, a bit easier than the conditional, P if and only if Q. Okay. P, Q, true, true, false, false, true, false, true, false. Let's fill in that information again. False, true, false. Okay. Because a biconditional establishes a very strong relationship between both sides of the biconditional, we say that the biconditional is true if and only if <laughs> uh, they match one another. So if P's truth value matches Q's truth value, the biconditional is true. So on row one, since both sides are true, they're matching. That's true. On row two, P is true while Q is false. They're not matching, so that's false. On row three, P is false while Q is true. They're not matching, so that's false. And finally, on the last row, they're both false. So they're matching, which means it's true. Okay, so... These are the basic truth tables for your connectives. Now you know how they work truth functionally, right? A biconditional is only true when both sides of it match in terms of truth value. For a conditional, it's only false if the antecedent is true while the consequent is false. For a disjunction, it's always true unless both disjuncts are false. For a conjunction, it's always false unless both sides are true. And for a negation, you simply flip the truth value of whatever it's applied to. Okay, so let's then look at some slightly more complicated examples before we get into arguments. Let's say, for example, I give you the uh, sentence, it is not the case that uh, P or Q. Let's start here. It's not the case that P or Q. Okay, well, the first thing we need to do is draw our lines. Okay. Next, we want to write what we're trying to give a truth table for in the rightmost column. It is not the case that P or Q. Okay. Then we want to fill out our reference columns. P, Q, we don't have any other sentence letters. I know I'm going to have true, false, true, false here. And I know I'm going to have true, true, false, false here. All right. And you should. Once we start doing arguments, you should start labeling your rows. So I have one, two, three, four. Now I'm going to move these over. I'm going to copy these over because uh, P is always the same. Q is always the same. There we go. And now I can start uh, 
applying this process to my connectives. So how should I start? Should I start with this or with this? Well, remember from the last video, since this negation symbol is outside of the parentheses, it is applying to this thing, the disjunction, which means until we figure out what the disjunction is, we don't know what to flip. So we need to start inside the parentheses first. We've got to start inside the parentheses first, always. Okay. So P or Q. Well, we know that a disjunction is true so long as both sides uh, aren't false. So this is going to be true, 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 and false. Why false on row four? P is false and Q is false. Okay. Now we can do the negation. Again, the negation just flips the truth value of whatever it applies to. So this is going to be false, 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 and true. Okay, so that's the truth table done, but you wanna draw special attention to this column. This column, let me get a square here. This column is the main meaning of the sentence, right? This is the truth value of the sentence. That negation symbol is what we call the primary or the main connective. It's the thing that's actually doing the expressing, right? The disjunction is just a part of that, okay? So this is the column that we really wanted. False, 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 true. That's the truth value of it's not the case that P or Q. Okay, let's do another one. Uh, let's get more complicated this time. Let's say, uh, and let's incorporate a third sentence letter. Let's move up to, to three. Um, let's say if P, then Q and R. Okay, if P, then Q and R. We're gonna start the same way by drawing our lines. Okay, we're going to write our sentence on the right side here. If P, then Q, and R. This time, we need three sentence letters in our reference column. Now, we're going to start the same way uh, we did earlier, uh, though this time we're going to need eight rows. Right? We'll need eight rows this time. So I'm gonna do true, false, iterating all the way down until I've done eight. Okay. Now I'm gonna move one column over to the left and I'm just gonna double the number of T's before I get to F's. So it's gonna look like this. True, true, false, false. This is easier on lined paper but try to keep them uh, parallel, your rows parallel. Okay, and I'm gonna do it again. I'm gonna double the number of trues before I get to falses. So I'm gonna have four trues back to back here, and then I'm gonna get my falses. Okay, now let's move these over to the left side. Common question at this point, do I need to do this step? Do I need to fill in this information if I've already written it on the left? Yes. Uh, technically speaking, uh, your truth table is not complete without this step. You are, uh, so to speak, not showing your work if you don't include this step. Uh, you can sort of eyeball the truth table if you're just looking to see for yourself whether an argument is valid or not. Um, but if you don't do this step, you aren't technically showing all your work. Okay, we wanna solve parentheses first. So we wanna solve Q and R first. Again, conjunction is only ever true if both sides are true. So let's go ahead and label these rows. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. On row one, it has to be true. On row two, it's false. 
because R is false. False on row three, false on row four, true on row five, and then false every other row. Okay. Now we're going to solve for the conditional. The conditional, very importantly, applies to this conjunction. So we're looking at if P, then this conjunction, okay? So when you're referencing, when you're comparing the two columns, you're gonna be comparing this column and this column, okay? Now a conditional we know is always true unless the left side, the antecedent, is true while the right side is false. So on row one, we know this has to be true because both sides are true. On row two, we know it has to be false because the left side is true and the right side is false. Uh, same thing on row three, same thing on row four. And for the rest of the way down, we know it's true. Why? Well, because the left side is all false the rest of the way down. So it's not possible for the left side to be true and the right side to be false, right? So it's gonna be true the rest of the way down. And this uh, column here is the, uh, the column you're looking for, right? This is the solution, right? Um, the main connective here for this sentence is this conditional. So we know that the truth value of this conditional is true, false, 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 true, 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 okay? All right, so that's the basics of uh, truth tables for individual propositions. Why do we want to do this? I mean, what's the purpose of making a map of all of the possible truth combinations for these things? Well, it's because we can use this tool to assess validity. Let's do that now with these arguments we saw earlier, okay? So let's do argument number one. Uh, if G, then R. G, therefore R. Okay, so the way we're going to do that is just like we did earlier with the construction of our truth tables. We're going to need a horizontal line, and we're going to need a vertical line. Okay. Now, for every uh, line you have in your argument, you're going to need another line, right? We'll see how this works as we go. We'll, we'll just build it up as we go. Let's start with the left. We know we only have two sentence letters, G and R. So we put those there. Now, premise one, if G, then R, okay? Now we need a line. This line indicates a break between premises. Okay, so premise two is just G. Now we need another line to indicate a break between the premise and the conclusion, which is R. Okay, now we have everything. We have two sentence letters. How many rows do we need? It's gonna be four, right? So it's gonna look like this, true, false, true, false, true, true, false, false. That's one, two, three, and four. Let's start with this first premise, if G then R. Well, first we have to fill in this information, true, true, false, false, true, false, true, false. A conditional is always true, unless the left side is true and the right side is false. So I know it's gonna look like this once again. Okay. Now we solve for the next premise. This one's pretty easy. We already have G, right? So we're just gonna copy over what we already have. True, true, false, false. And the same thing for the conclusion. We already have R. So we're just gonna copy over what we already have. And that's, it as far as diagramming the truth table is concerned. Uh, maybe we want to put 
I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Maybe we want to put some kind of uh, indicator with a highlighter or a box or something that this is, um, you know, the, the main connective here. But otherwise, we're done. How do we determine the validity of an argument once we have given a complete truth table for it? What we have just done is construct a complete truth table. Well, remember, an argument is valid just in case its premises would guarantee its conclusion. In other words, if the premises are true, the conclusion must also be true. Well, now that we've diagrammed all the possible truth combinations, we can actually go looking for all the times the premises are true. Look, this premise is true here, and so is this premise. So on row one, all the premises are true. Okay, well, that means if this argument is valid, the conclusion also better be true, and it is. Okay, so that's good, but we have to keep checking. Now, on row two, this premise is false, so we don't even need to check this row. It's not relevant to the validity of this argument. We're only looking for rows where all the premises are true. Okay, on row three, this premise is true, but this premise is false. So again, it's not relevant. On row four, this premise is true, but again, this premise is false, and therefore this row is not relevant. So what we have found is that on every row where the premises are true, the conclusion is also true, which means this is a valid argument, right? We cannot find a single case where all the premises are true and the conclusion is false. Let's look at an example where that's not the case. Let's say we have, um, let's keep things simple. We still have if G then R. And this time is our second premise. We have R, conclusion G, okay? So let's make a complete truth table for this. First up, we need to draw our lines. Line for the reference columns. Let's fill those reference columns in. G, R, put our premise. If G, then R. Go ahead and put another line to indicate a break between this premise and the next one. Second premise is just R. One more line here between this premise and the conclusion, which is G. Okay, let's fill in our reference column, true, false. It's not very good. True, false, true, false, and true, true, false, false. Let's fill this in again here, true, true, False, false, true, false, true, false. Okay, so let's solve for if G then R. Well, again, it's going to look the exact same, right? True, false, true, true. Row one, two, three, and four. Why on row two is it false? Because the antecedent G is true, but the consequent R is is false. Okay, that's the only way that a conditional can be false. The only way. Now R, we just gonna we're just gonna bring that information over. True, false, true, and false. And G, we just bring that information over as well. True, true, false, false. Okay. Let's give some kind of indication that this conditional is the main connective for this column. And now we can check. Is this argument valid? Well, we're going to look for all the rows where the premises are true. Okay, those are the only ones that are relevant. On this row, the first premise is true and the second premise is true. But the conclusion is also true, so that's fine. Okay? On row two, this premise is false. So row two is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. On row three, this premise is true and this premise is true. But look, the conclusion is false. That's not supposed to be possible 
for a valid argument. The premises are supposed to guarantee the truth of the conclusion. And therefore, I can say this argument is invalid. And I would want to point my reader in the direction uh, to see that this is the case. So I would say invalid row three, right? Each row is like a possible world, a way things could be. So we're saying in this world, world three, uh, the argument doesn't work. And therefore, it's not a valid argument. Okay. So this is how we use truth tables uh, to check for the validity of an argument. All right. Um, now that you have all of these basic elements, let's do one slightly more complicated example of checking for validity using a truth table. Okay. So let me get rid of all of this. And we can start fresh. Uh, let's go fairly complicated. Let's say um, have A and B, then C. Uh, you also know that uh, either not C or D, it's not the case that D, therefore, um, A or B. Fairly complicated, right? Premise one, if A and B, then C. Premise two, it's not the case that C or D. Premise three is just not D. Conclusion, A or B. So let's start out with our lines. Gonna need that horizontal line. We're gonna, let's make it quite long this time. Uh, and we'll need reference columns. Okay. So we're going to put all of our sentence letters down. We have A, we have B, we have C, and we have D. That's four, right? That's more than we've done so far. How many rows is four going to take? Well, it's 16. We're going to need 16 rows for this. So I'm going to need true, false all the way down until I get to 16. That's four. And 11, 12, 13, 14. I'm going to need to extend this line, as you can see. 15 and 16. Let's make this line longer. Okay. Now I'm going to move one over to the left. So for C, and I'm going to double the number of T's before I start doing F's. So that's going to be true, true, false, false, true, true, false, false, true, true, false, false, true, true, false, and false. Okay. I'm going to do the same for B. I'm going to double the number of T's before I get to F's. So I need four trues in a row before I get to F's. And then last one, I'm going to want eight trues back to back and then all F's after that. One, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Okay, let's label our rows. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 14, 15, and 16. Done. Now we can put the actual argument in, right? So we have if A and B are 
than C. And we need a line. <clears throat> it's not the case that C or D. Need another line. Not D. One more line. A or B. Okay. So I want to transpose all of my reference columns uh, to each instance of these sentence letters. Since I'm doing this digitally, I'm going to copy paste these things instead of rewriting all of that. Uh, so bear with me for a moment while I do that. I'm going to put A, the same A column everywhere. I have A's. Need to grab B now. Uh, slightly messed up here, but I can fix this. True, 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 false. Okay. And I need C and D. Let's get C. And last up is D. I'm going to have to fix that. Okay, great. <laughs> Already looking pretty messy, right? The more sentence letters you have, the bigger and more unwieldy these truth tables become. Uh, let's start with the first premise. If A and B, then C. We have to solve for the conjunction first because it's in parentheses. A conjunction, we know, is only true if both sides of it are true. So it's going to go true, 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 false, 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 false is all the rest of the way down. Okay, now we can solve for this conditional. This conditional is treating C as the consequent and this conjunction as the antecedent, okay? All right, which means that conjunction column, if it's ever true and the C column is false, the conditional is false. Otherwise, the conditional is true. So on row one, we have true and true, that's true. Row two, true and true makes true. Row three, true and false makes false. Row four, true and false, makes false. Row five, false and true, makes true. And notice the conditional, I mean, the, uh, the conjunction here, all the rest of the way down is false. When you have a conditional that has a false antecedent, it's true. The conditional is true. So I'm just going to write true as the rest of the way down, right? Just true is the rest of the way down. Okay, get rid of this. Okay, next I have, it's not the case that C or D. Now this negation symbol is applying to C. In fact, let me move this column over slightly. We need to flip the truth value of C before we can solve for that disjunction, right? Because that disjunction is not between C and D, it's between not C and D. So let's just flip the truth values of C here. It's going to be false, false, true, true, false, 
false, true, true, false, false, true, true, false, false, true, true. Great. Now, this disjunction can be solved. It's pairing these two things. Okay. So we're looking at the negation column and the D column. Now again, a disjunction is always true unless both sides are false. So on row one, it's true. On row two, it's false. True, 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 false, true, 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 false. That's misleading. Let's fix this one. There we go. True, 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 false, true, and true. Okay. Things are getting a bit messy. So let's go ahead and make our um, main connectives clear. This is our main connective for this sentence. This is our main connective for this sentence, okay? All right, not D, it's pretty easy to solve for. We're just gonna flip the truth values of D, all right? So that's going to be false, true, false, true, false, true, false, true, just iterating all the way down here. False and true. This two is going to be our main connective for this line. Here. And last, we have to solve for our conclusion, A or B. Okay. Let me move this over. It's easier to write. There we go. We know that a disjunction is true so long as one side or both sides are true. False if both sides are false. Right? So true, 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 true. False here because both sides are false. And false the rest of the way down, it looks like. One more box. You do that. And yeah, that'll have to do. Okay, so the truth table is complete. The truth table is done. Now we want to go row by row looking for occasions in which all the premises are true. Okay, so on row one, this is true, this is true, but this is false. Okay. So row one is irrelevant. We need all of them. We need this, we need this, this, and this to all be true at the same time, okay? <laughs> okay, row two, we have true, we have false again, so irrelevant, we can move on. False, we can move on. False, we can move on. Okay, true, true, and but false again. We can move on, it doesn't matter, it's irrelevant. True, false, irrelevant, true, true, false again. So this row is irrelevant. True, true, ooh, true this time. Okay, so finally on row eight, we have a relevant row. All the premises are true here. So we are hoping that our conclusion is also true on this row. Uh, if it's not, then the argument is invalid. And we find that the conclusion is true on this row. Again, on lined paper, these things <laughs> line up much better than uh, like this. Uh, so row eight is fine. Row eight does not prove that this argument is invalid, so we need to move on, check for other possibilities. 
uh, on row nine, first premise is true, second premise is true, but again, the third premise is false, okay? Oof, this program jumps sometimes. One moment. Okay. Row 10, the first premise is true. The second premise is false, so it's irrelevant. On row 11, the first premise is true. The second premise is true. Uh, but the third premise is, again, false. Row 12, true, true, and true. Okay, so again... We get to check the conclusion. Does it have a true uh, or false? It's got a true. So still fine. Still haven't proven that it's invalid. Let's move on to row 13. True, true, false, irrelevant. Row 14, true, false, irrelevant. Row 15, true, true, and false. Eh, okay, doesn't matter. Last row, row 16, true, 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 okay? So uh, we're looking to see whether our conclusion is true or false. It's false, see? Uh, this means that it, while it took us <laughs> um, an entire truth table to get here, we did end up finding a possibility of all premises being true, but the conclusion being false. Okay, that means this argument is invalid. Okay, invalid row 16. Okay, um, let's look back at the argument itself, try to figure out why, right? Um, the first premise says if A and B then C. So if these two things are true at the same time, you should expect C to follow. Okay. Uh, second premise says it's not the case that C or D, but premise three says not D, which means the only way for that uh, disjunction to be true is for not C to be true. So we know that C is going to end up being false. Okay. Uh, now, uh, we have gathered some information, right? C is false. Okay, well, what can we do with that? We also know that by premise one, A and B are supposed to guarantee C. Well, if I know that C is false, I know that A and B is not true. Okay, so A and B is not true. Does that information lead me to A or B is true? No, because everything could just be false here. And indeed, if we look at our reference columns, that's the only time we found the premises don't guarantee the conclusion. Look, A, B, C, D, these things could all be false. And if they are, A or B does not follow. Okay, but for the purposes of assessing validity, all you're really going to do with a full truth table like this is go row by row looking for true premises. You want all of the premises to be true at once. See if the conclusion is true or false. If it's true, keep going. Keep checking the rest of the table. If the conclusion is false, however, you can stop. You know the argument is invalid. Cite the row where you found it, and you're done. If you get to the end of the table and you never found an occasion in which all the premises are true, and the conclusion is false, your argument's valid. It's a good argument. The structure of it makes it valid, okay? Now, there's a few tricks. Uh, you're likely not going to encounter many of these in the wild, so to speak, but there are gonna be occasions in which your premises are never all true, right? They're just not going to be true together at the same time. That can happen if your premises are um, contradictory. You know, they are uh, denying one another. Like, they literally say the opposite thing. Um, you know, you, you might have heard of, like, mutually exclusive truth before, right? These, these two things are mutually exclusive. Well, you can have premises that are mutually exclusive, right? If premise one is true, premise two has to be false. 
And if premise two is true, premise one has to be false. Well, if you have a situation like that, you're never going to have a row where all of your premises are true. What does that mean for the, for the test of validity here? Well, if you can't find a row where all the premises are true and the conclusion is false, the argument is valid. Okay, So that would be a valid argument. An argument that contains a contradiction um, within its premises is always valid. Just a little quirk that you might see from time to time as we start moving forward in modern logic. As you can see with this last example, truth tables can get really big. They can get really unwieldy. I mean, this is only with four sentence letters. You can have as many sentence letters as you want in an argument. If we add even one more, let's say we add E, now we're looking at 32 rows, right? And the next one is 64, okay? Uh, you can see how messy this looks already. So while a truth table is nice because it can it can show you whether an argument is valid or not um, in its pure form, right? It's really difficult to make a mistake here unless you get one of the T's or F's wrong in your reference columns. Um, but it, it takes a long time, right? You're not a computer. It's going to take you a long time to build these truth tables. So starting next week, we're going to be looking at another way to assess validity using modern logic. Specifically, we're going to start trying to learn how to build proofs. We're going to try to prove our arguments instead of kind of brute forcing all of their truth values by listing all of their possibilities like a truth table does. Okay, but that's going to be it for this week. So stay healthy, stay safe, and see you next time.